Uh, so uh, welcome, Fitzroy. Thank and, you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here on our first edition of Stand Up Desk. Um, we last spoke about the Jerome Avenue rezoning a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, tell us where that process stands now. Where, where does it stand? Right now, everything, and we all are just waiting. Um, the city is not very communicative in terms of what they're doing and their time frames for doing anything. So we are waiting for them to tell us um, where they are, when they intend to start ULERP, and especially whether or not any of our recommendations, especially our priorities, are being considered and if they're going to be included into whatever it is they intend to go forward with. Do you feel the delay is a, is a good thing, is a bad thing? How do you feel about the fact that it's, it's been pushed back several times? The fact that it, it has been pushed back is good. Why? It gives us the impression that they may be considering um, our recommendations. But the fact that they're not communicating with us is bothersome. Um, it could be that they're pushing it back, they're delaying the process because it suits them. They want to respond in their own way to the community pressures so that they may add what they want to add that will make it politically beneficial to them. If we were part of the conversation, if we knew what, were happen what was happening, we may feel differently. Mm -hmm. But not when, uh, when, when the rezoning was first bandied about, you know, they called it the Cromwell the Jerome, which Jerome. Was an unrecognizable designation. Right. Um, when you and I spoke uh, a couple of years ago, you referred to this as a, a good plan uh, that you were very much frightened of. That was that was a while ago. I mean, yeah. since then we've had the East New York rezoning. The NIH proposal has gone mm -hmm. through. They changed how they refer to this rezoning. Do you feel yeah. as though city planning is making an effort to be more reactive, more responsive to community input? Do you feel that's genuine? Has anything changed? No. Nothing. Now I think it is the same old program they are hoping to force down the throats of the residents on Jerome Avenue and the environs. Um, because they have not really met with us in a way to say, okay, you, the coalition, have already given us um, a, um, a, a platform, um, a program, a whole, how should I put it? You have given us your ideas of how the of zoning could go forward. You achieve almost everything that you're asking for, but without the massive displacements, without the dislocation of the auto workers, without the complete destruction of the community and the traditions that have been there for so many years. How can we merge what you've given us with what we have? They haven't done that. Um, about three weeks ago, the DCP came out with their report of all the wonderful things they have done, um, how many meetings they have had, um, community involvement. But I have been to virtually every one of their public meetings, um, all of their hearings. In each and every one of them, the presenters far outnumber the people from the community who are there to hear what it is that they're doing. Plus, the community wasn't given an opportunity to give their own ideas. What they were doing was selecting from what the DCP had. How do you like this? Which one do you prefer? This, 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 or this? So the community's input, as they call it, was actually choosing for what they had planned, what their vision was. Nothing of the community vision was uh, really involved. So. so talk about the vision, because the Bronx Coalition for a Community Vision mm -hmm. actually issued their, uh, their vision Which before is, the city came out with any of their proposals. Yes. What do you see? You mentioned displacement, the auto workers. Mm -hmm. What are the bottom lines in, in your plan um, that you presented, or your vision that you're a part of? Okay. In that um, vision that we presented, there were about 23 recommendations, but we have prioritized them. And we are saying that there are a number of them that we are not going to support any movement from where they are now. We're not going to support the upgrade, the upzoning unless these basic 
um, recommendations are met. And one of them is the right to counsel. We know that um, the city hall and the city council have all agreed that it is in, it's the time for it and they are supporting it. Has but the provision we, of counsel to indigent, indigent defendants in housing? Yes, right. because we believe that tenants need that type of protection. Whenever there is an upzoning in any area, the landowners, the developers, they go crazy because it's a way for them to make money. So the pressure is on a lot of tenants, I mean, residential tenants, commercial tenants. And a lot of them in, the, in our area, especially the commercial tenants, are not getting the 5, 10, 15 year leases anymore. Then most of them are month to month. Um, quite a few of them, their rents have gone up from three, four thousand dollars a month, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month. That is the pressure that the upzoning brings on the community. A lot of these people are going to be losing their businesses if the city doesn't make any provision to accommodate them. Um, the same thing for the tenants. There is a lot of action going on in the zip codes that are going to be affected by the upzoning in Jerome Avenue. Um, in housing court, we see them to the extent that the city itself has allocated large sums of money to protect those two zip codes and two zip codes that are in the surrounding areas. And they are building up the legal support to make sure that these tenants are protected in housing court because of the pressures that they realize that the subzoning is bringing on the community. We want to make sure that the right to counsel is actually passed. We want to make sure that it is properly funded so that as they go along with the upzoning, the tenants are going to be protected so they can stay in their homes. Other than right to counsel, what are the other sort of top priorities would you say? Um, certificate of no harassment. We want to make sure that the bad actors, the developers, homeowners, um, Landlords, those who have a history of harassing tenants, those who have a history of giving bad deal to tenants in the sense that they give you a preferential rent, let us say, knowing that you would not be able to afford it. So that a year from now you're in arrears because you can't, you can't even afford the preferential rent. Or if you can, they take it away and now you have to face the full legal rent. It is unaffordable, so the tenant is either lease voluntarily or is taken to court in order to leave. They then apply the 20% vacancy exception. So a rent which was less than 1500 is now 1750 for the next tenant. And they do the same thing, give it to somebody who cannot afford to pay the 1750 So by the next year, they go through the same process of getting that person out, adding the 20% exception, all of a sudden that apartment is $2,000 per month. And they do that so they could get it up to that threshold to make it, um, to take it off of the rent stabilized walls and into the market rent. Um, these are the some of the things that are happening. So we are saying that with a certificate of no harassment, we want to make sure that those type of um, developers, those type of landlords, do not participate in this new development. It makes so, no sense for that. Right to counsel and certificate of no harassment are citywide uh, policy proposals yes. or issues. Specific to the neighborhood itself, mm -hmm. um, many neighborhoods, they talk about uh, height limits, or d density limits, specific sort of zoning issues. Mm -hmm. Have any of those come up in the discussion so far, or have you not gotten to that point? Yes, they have come up. Um, we have offered using Banana Kelly as the lead organization in other community developers to come up with a different term sheet. Um, not only does it go deeper in the sense of affordability for those at the very, very bottom of the economic scale, but we think, and that um, term sheet, that plan, includes different density levels. Um, and a term sheet would be the basically the parameters of the deal that HPD and the city present to developers, yes. you get subsidies X for deliverables Y, and that would be exactly. the affordability you're talking about. Yes. Right. And not only that, but we try to keep um, that plan um, that the developers, the community developers presented, 
tries to keep the community as much an, as intact as possible the way it is. Um, it also includes use of space that is not being used now. And it is also calling, well, not only the, the new term sheet, but other priorities that we have. It's calling for the city to work with, especially the auto workers, to get the training so that they could come up to speed in terms of codes. A lot of them do not have access to the yards, the backyards of the places that they rent. So they're forced to do their businesses on the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. We are asking that the city work with them to renegotiate the type of contracts they get, the leases they get from the developers or the landowners so that they can come off of the street and be doing their businesses inside. Um, you may be aware that for more than 30 years, those guys did their businesses on the streets of there. Uh, got very few tickets from like sanitation. Yes. Time, right? Until now that they want to redevelop the area, they're seen as nuisances and they're getting so many tickets, it's the most, it's ridiculous really. I want to ask you about that, about mm -hmm. the coalition, uh, which is really interesting in that it combines, among others, tenants, um, construction workers, the auto industry that's mm -hmm. in the area. Um, Faith-based. Right. They, they found some sort of common cause, but I wonder um, how, how robust is that coalition? I mean, at some point, some of those groups might find their interests opposed to one another. Tell tenants may not want new construction because it's going to change the neighborhood. Construction workers might. The auto industry might want to have a presence that some tenants would prefer they did not have. How do you think you'll square all that once you get down to the details of the city's proposal? Well, so far we haven't had that problem. Um, what's happening is that apart from the general, we meet once every month as a coalition. And apart from that, we have several groups that meet almost weekly the faith-based groups and auto workers, the smaller commercial tenants, the beauty saloon people, the barbers, the pharmacies, the daily workers. We have meetings regularly to see what is it that we all want that we are comfortable with. So before we come back to the general meetings, we already know that this um, demographic, this let's say the commercial tenants, this is their vision, this is what they would like to see. Does it conflict with what the auto workers are looking for? And does what the, ten the residential tenants want conflict with what they want? Or how can we put the pieces together? And then at the general meeting where we all are, we go into our smaller working groups and hammer these things out and I come up with a plan that everybody's happy with. So that we do not come to a meeting, whether with the DCP or any city agency, and we're fighting because we don't know where we are, we're opposed to whatever. Right, we're all on the same page. We're all on the same page. So we've been having these regular meetings all the time. So we know where each other is. Talking about coming up with something that makes everyone happy, uh, this coalition mm -hmm. held a, a hearing or a meeting, I believe it was late February, early March, yep. to which the local council members who will have vast sway over whether this plan goes forward or not were mm -hmm. invited, yes. Vanessa Gibson and Fernando Cabrera. Cabrera. Yeah. Um, and the last question that was asked was basically, if the plan the city puts on the table does not meet the bottom line, some of which you've articulated, mm -hmm. are you willing to vote no? And I listened to their answer a couple of times and, and I didn't hear them uh, say a clear yes or no on that. What kind of support do you think you have from the local electeds when it comes to your kind of bill of particulars? Are they going to be there for you? We are getting a strong sense from Council Member Gibson that she will be pushing very, very hard for our recommendations. Council Member Cabrera, he, I would want to say maybe a junior person because Vanessa has a larger part of the upzoning area. So she's going to be impacted much more so than mm -hmm. Cabrera. He has indicated that he is prepared to go along and support um, Councilmember Gibson. Um, we're maybe a year, a year and a half ago, he was kind of hesitant to make some kind of commitments. 
he seems to be moving closer and closer to the position that we are asking for. But we have not had a definitive yes from either of them, though we see some measure of support. Um, Councilmember Gibson has publicly um, stated over and over that she fully supports the vision that we presented and that she would love to see it implemented. Do you wish that the uh, rezoning vote took place before the election so that you could uh, send a message if, uh, if you don't get the support you're expecting? And how do you, how do you kind of keep uh, public officials like that uh, accountable? Well, the coalition um, has let it be known quite clearly that if we don't get what we want, we're going to be fighting to stop it. We're going to be going to the streets. We're going to be doing everything that we can. Um, community activist work, um, whether we may have to take legal action if, if that's a possible recourse, whatever it takes to make sure that ULOB doesn't happen, we're prepared to do that. If ULOB does happen, because we really don't have the power to stop it, we can try to persuade the city not to begin it until certain conditions are met, but we can't really stop it. But So if they do start it, then we are prepared to take to the streets to heighten our activist work to see how we can get the council members to say no when it comes to the city council. If it happens before the elections, um, and they do have um, opponents. We may look at that as to see what leverage, how we can use that as a leverage to get them to commit and to act in their commitment. Um, but as it is right now, no, we have not um, have any clear plan as to what we are going to do, who we are going to be going after. We are focusing on getting the two sitting council members to commit to supporting our vision and pushing for it um, in the city council. So last question, yeah. uh, we talk about the rezoning sometimes kind of in a vacuum. It's obviously one of several issues that could face neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. In the past few weeks, the mayor has talked about building 90 new homeless shelters around the city, mm -hmm. including uh, a focus on the neighborhoods that tend to generate a lot of the, the business that the shelter system gets, which you know, the Bronx is, is clearly one, mm -hmm. and more recently talking about closing Rikers and the necess necessity of perhaps building neighborhood facilities, borough mm -hmm. facilities to handle the remaining uh, inmate population. How would you feel if, uh, separate from the rezoning process or part of it, the city came to you and said that we feel as though um, Jerome Avenue could use an additional homeless shelter facility? or perhaps a correctional facility, um, you know, because of the citywide goals, those would support mm -hmm. housing writers and housing homeless people. What do you think the reaction would be? We haven't discussed that as an organization, but personally I would be opposed to it. I don't think building shelters is a solution to homelessness. I think making homes affordable and providing the necessary subsidies um, the same monies that they would be using to build shelters and to provide the social services around it can be better used um, to build permanent homes for people, um, subsid have subsidized the rents for those tenants who um, are having great difficulty in affording the current rents, even if they may be low. If they were to provide those type of subsidies, that would immediately reduce the number of people who are forced out of their homes because they can't afford it. That would lessen the need to be building shelters. Um, <clears throat> I believe that if the city goes ahead with the plans to build these shelters, it's because they're giving up or they're thinking that there will always be large numbers of homeless peoples, which means they're not... Um, planning, they have no intentions of looking at the cause of the problem, which is unaffordable housing mainly. Um, there are some other things as well where landlords with their tenant lists are preventing people, some other people from getting apartments because they may have been in court for one reason or another. 
Yes, but if the city were to attack that um, in, in terms of legislation to prevent that from stopping the tenant from getting a new home, a new apartment, then that will also have the homelessness. Um, there are uh, quite a lot of people in the shelters who are working, full-time workers, but they can't get an, um, an apartment because the landlord bought them to court 10, 15 years ago, maybe for non-payment, or there was some issue that took them to court, which is preventing them from getting a home. That needs to be addressed and corrected, rather than be thinking about building shelters. What the city needs to do is to come up with a comprehensive plan of using the money that it would give to developers. And how are they going to use that, um, giving it in subsidies directly to tenants, to residents, to small businesses, so that the displacement um, becomes um, something